You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We're coming to you from the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to Rethreading Madness. When I've never been further Knowing what the hell I'm gonna do When I can't seem to find my way Under or over or through You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio. CFR 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Jennifer O'Brien, who is the author of a book entitled The Hospice Doctor's Widow, a journal. Welcome, Jennifer. Why, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to talk about grief, and you're here because your grief experience is how is your term, and I, and I love that term. But can you tell folks a little bit about who you are before we begin? Sure, sure. Um, I, uh, I lost my only sibling 40 years ago when I was 18 and he was 13. It was an accident. Um, he was in a motor vehicle accident and then died three weeks later when he was extubated. And about 20 years after that, my mom, um, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she lived for about five weeks and I took care of her until she died. Um, and then years later, uh, I've, I've been, I've been in healthcare my entire field here in the States and um, mostly on the administrative and business side of healthcare doing interim leadership for large physician organizations. And I came from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I was spending most of my time at that point down to Little Rock, Arkansas, to be the interim CEO of a large orthopedic surgery practice. And while I was here, I met and fell in love with a, an, a wonderful man named Bob Lemberg, who was a hospice and palliative care physician. And we fell crazy in love and we um, got married. And part of the reason I fell in love with him, Bernadine, was because of the palliative care and the hospice work that he did having lost both my brother and my mom and some other family, you know, more distant family members, I knew how important that work was. He was super cute and funny and smart and all that good stuff. And so we fell in love and we um, had this wonderful life. I finished up the orthopedic job. Um, he was on faculty at our, at our medical center here. And um, one day he found a couple of lumps on the left side of his neck. And after some diagnostics, it was determined to be an already metastatic stage four oh. renal clear cell carcinoma. And so what, you know, what the care and the insights and the wisdom that he had been providing for patients all those years, now we sort of had to turn those on ourselves. And um, I, I'm also a self-taught artist. And I started keeping an art journal um, purely as a form of self-care. It just was me documenting my thoughts and my feelings using digital collage and lots of written notes. And um, he lived for 22 months following the diagnosis. Um, we very thoroughly prepared for his death and my survivorship. Um, and I kept going with the art journaling for about a year and a half after he died, at which point um, I was now doing a CEO position for a large multi-specialty medical practice. And one of the neurologists that I worked with there was in the process of diagnosing three different patients with ALS, another terminal diagnosis. And so I brought my art journal into him um, and he took it home and read it and came back the next day and said, Jen, you're not getting your journal back. <laughs> I will be <laughs> loaning it to these patients and, and to their spouses. Um, and you need to figure out how to get that thing published because it will help a lot of people to, to read and look at your art journal and see what you went through. Um, 
It'll help them feel less alone. It'll help them manage what's ahead of them. Well, you can imagine how compelling that was. The idea that my journal might help some other people. So I went to work and found a very small independent press and they took a chance on this journal and it became a book, as you said, called The Hospice Doctor's Widow, a journal. And it went out into the world about three weeks before the pandemic shut the world down. Right. Um, yeah, which actually turned out to be a good thing, I think. Um, and uh, it won a bunch of very prestigious awards. And moreover, and important to me, it um, it's helped a lot of people um, in a lot of different ways. And then just uh, not this last summer, but the summer before my father died. Um, he had had a heart and lung disease for a long time and he broke his hip. He fell and broke his hip. And, um, you know, without being able to ambulate and being entirely dependent on the BiPAP, um, we, uh, he made the decision to not have a surgery and to just, uh, to just be comfortable. And, um, I was with him when he died as well. So mm -hmm. that's why I call myself grief experienced. Um, not a grief expert, but, but I've figured some stuff out over the years on the topic of grief. And so I say, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm grief experienced. So let's talk about the things that can cause grief. So you, you, your grief, or at least a part of your grief comes from the experience of losing people in your life to death. Um, but grief can come from all kinds of things, right? Like we could lose um, a job. We could lose friends. We could lose, we could move and realize that we're grieving um, having moved away from, uh, we could grieve because we're estranged from people we love um, yes. and need to be. Uh, what else? What did I miss in there? Substantive life change that, that results in a loss um, certainly can result in, in grief. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a good response. I mean, that's a natural response to loss. Mm -hmm. um, a, a breakup, you know, break up with someone that you've been close with, um, a friendship that ends. Those are all things totally worthy of grief. Mm -hmm. Yes. And grief is not something we are necessarily um, growing up experiencing. Um, for some people, it can be uh, a new feeling, um, or certainly the intensity of it can be a new feeling. So we don't really have a lot of um, experience processing grief. I think probably someone like yourself may have had more than a lot of people, but I know a lot of people who end up getting well into their adulthood without having anyone around them um, die. Um, right. I, yeah. So why is it important to talk about grief? Well, you know, I think the whole name it and claim it thing is, is perhaps the first reason that we've we allow when you don't call it what it is and and start to understand it for what it is i think it gets larger than it needs to be and it, it can become worse in some ways i remember when my late husband bob was ill and sh shortly after oh, after we got his diagnosis and um i was really struggling i mean struggling with lots of stuff, but I was struggling in particular with knowing how much it was going to hurt when he died because I'd already lost my mom and my brother. And a friend of mine said, you've got anticipatory grief, kind of like, duh. And I had never heard that term before. And so I went and looked it up and sure enough, I discovered, you know, what it was that it's sort of grieving something grieving a death or a loss before it actually happens um i discovered a study where you know 40 percent of widows i think it was in sweden described anticipatory grief as worse than the grief following the death of their partner oh. um, which totally legitimized what i was feeling and that really like i said named it and claimed it that's what this is and now and now that I know what it is, I am going to honor it 
but not let it ruin the time I have left with him. And mm -hmm. so um, that's why I think it's important to just face grief. We've even got kind of an aversion to the term grief in our society. You know, people, people think, it, oh, it's just sad. And sad is, you know, not happy. And happy is what everybody wants. And so um, I, I think it's super important to you know, call it what it is and to, and to think about how you feel and why you're feeling a certain way. And if you discover that part of that is grief, um, to explore that. And in my case, you know, I do that a lot with, with art. So I create something that helps me <laughs> process and identify, oh, the other order, identify and then process, you know, what the, what the thoughts and feelings are. For people who are around someone who's grieving, um, we're going to get into, you have 10 sort of thoughts on how to make um, grieving easier, especially around holidays. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what people can do around somebody, a friend or a relative or a child who is grieving. What what kinds of things can they do to help? Well, I think the first thing is not to give up on them. Um, that, you know, you may check in or you may invite them to something and then they say, no, they're not up to it. And then you start to think, oh, they, you know, in the future you start to think, oh, they won't want to do this because they already said no, um, you know, to something else. And, and that's just not, that's not how it works. I would say, don't give up on them. Um, perhaps the best thing uh, I think you can do for someone in a lot of different challenging situations, but certainly grief, is to, um, you know, check in usually by something as one-sided as a text, but not have any real expectation that they will respond, right? So just thinking of you, or I like to send, I have some friends that are grieving right now and I periodically, every couple of days, I send them a, you know, a heart or a little bouquet, you know, emoji kind of thing that just reminds them that they are not forgotten and they are not alone and their grief is not forgotten. And, um, and I don't really, you know, I don't really expect them to respond. And usually I try, if, if this person doesn't know me very well and doesn't know that I do that, then I try to let them know. And in, in the first couple of texts, I say, Hey, listen, I'm going to keep in touch. I'm going to, I'm going to think about you and I'm going to let you know it. And you don't have to respond if it's not, if it's not comfortable for you. Um, and I, I have a number of friends that I have. Um, and actually I have one woman who's going through something right now. I don't know her. I, I mean, I've never met her. I've only met her son and he told me all about her and she's taking care of her her um, sister who's dying of cancer. And so, um, you know, I introduced myself over text. Her, her son gave me her number um, with her permission and I text her periodically. Um, and she's, she's a real sweetheart. I mean, mm -hmm. but we don't even know each other right. um, really. So, so I think that's the first thing is um, be there um, that, and check in frequently with just messages of support um, messages, if you're going to write words, they it needs to end in a period, not a question mark, right? Mm -hmm. um, lots of people do things like, um, let me know what I can do to help. And that's mm -hmm. really not that helpful. No. <laughs> actually, um, because that really leaves the person who is grieving or caregiving or whatever the, the heavy load is, it leaves it up to them to tell you what they need. And- mm -hmm. Most of the time, you're really not in a position to do that. Um, and even if you if you thought you were, I'm I'm not sure I would I would do that, right? Because it's 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 that is a sort of a phrase. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help that makes makes the sayer feel better that they've offered, but it doesn't always feel super genuine. Um, so that's really not that helpful helpful what is helpful in those cases you know if you've got if you've got a griever a friend who's grieving 
Um, one thing is that's really great is in the morning to text them and say, at about one o'clock, I am headed to the grocery store. And if you send me a short list, I, I will pick some things up for you and leave them on your doorstep. And that way, I know that I have a couple hours to figure out what my list is. I know that when you pick these things up for me at the grocery, you're not going to then expect a long visit from me because I may not be up to that sort of thing. So it's really a much more genuine offer to help. Or, you know, I'm headed over to the coffee shop and I am going to get your favorite drink and leave it, you know, leave it at your doorstep. Um, and if you don't know their favorite drink, you could say, what's your favorite drink? Um, so anyway, those kinds of things, I think those more pinpointed things. Um, and then to just trust that they that they will come out of it. They they it, it gets it gets it it gets less heavy to carry. And then you you learn how to carry it. Never it never goes away. They don't get they don't get over it. That was that's another thing that's really bothersome is when people say, When are you gonna get over it? Never gonna mm -hmm. get over it. Never gonna get over it. Mm -hmm. Right. You're not gonna get over your husband and he's still alive. So I'm not gonna get over mine because he's died. Right. 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 But but I'm but I'm gonna learn to carry this grief um and this and this love that I continue to carry for him. Um and I'm gonna get better at it. And and it's and I uh I think I think that's another another thing. The other thing um that I think is important is to remember the and, right? That it's almost always more accurate to use to use the conjunction and um rather than or or but. So I can be grieving and healing. I can even be grieving and laughing, right? It's mm. not either or. And people see someone who's lost somebody and they see them enjoying a, a joke or a funny, a funny whatever. And they think, oh, it's over. Oh, she's better now. Right. And that's not how that works. Right. We can do both. We are complex beings and and we can do both. And in fact, you both all the time. So it's almost always an and. Right. Um, That's yeah. actually a very good suggestion, even with uh, people who are depressed, you know, yes. that, to recognize yes. that even if somebody is depressed, they may have moments where they're feeling happy and good. And it doesn't mean that all is good. We just need to take a little break, Jennifer, but folks, we'll be right back. Eh, Tony up. Could we get you on Queen Sna? Hi, everybody. My name is Quigate Ewans. I'm a member of the Squamish Nation and the Yogalanis Clan of the Haida Nation. You're listening to Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We live, work, play, and broadcast from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. <laughs> Everything's gonna be 
on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, sitting down, virtually of course, with Jennifer O'Brien, who is also known as a hospice doctor's widow, who has written a book about grief. Well, I'm not sure. Is that accurate? Maybe it's not accurate. Yeah, so- no, it, sorry, it's really both um, when I was taking care of my husband before he died, mm-hmm. and then for a bit after. So, so it's some about grief. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what absolutely. are some of the common things that are common emotions that people might feel along with grief? Does d- grief come on its own or are there other emotions that come attached to it? Oh my gosh. Yes. I think that's a, that's a great point, Bernadine. It's a, it's a lot of times grief, I think is an overlay emotion, right? You get, you, we are emotional beings. We have all sorts of emotions. And then after we've suffered a significant loss, the grief is both the underlay and the overlay of all of all the regular emotions and and some new ones. Um, I think um, people frequently ask the question, you know, I'm they say things like I can't stop eating. Is that normal? Yep, that's normal, <laughs> right? Like sometimes you're just insatiable when you have grief and other times um, you have no appetite, literally, figuratively. And so, um, so yeah, all the, all the standard emotions can, can go along with grief, some of the less standard ones, and then some surprising ones, you know, like something you've never experienced. Um, uh, and then all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, feeling something that has been, that's new to you. Um, and it's probably part of your grief. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, anger. Sure. Sure. Um, I was very angry after at times after my brother died, but both, both when he first died and many years later, when it was very clear, right, that I was on my own taking care of my aging parents mm. um, who were divorced. They they had divorced before David died. And I remember, yes, being very, very angry with him for um, leaving me alone with those two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yes, anger is perfectly natural feeling and it's and it's you know it's rough because 
And you don't want to be angry at somebody you miss that much. No. Um, but, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that's come up since my book came out was this idea about very thoroughly preparing for end of life. Um, so different from my brother would be, um, I, I'm in a lot of widows groups and um, a lot, you know, most people have not prepared for their death or, um, uh, or the death of their partner. And um, so in these widows groups, we've got a lot of widowed people whose partner died without any preparation. And the amount of work and confusion and loss, I mean, literal loss of money, of photos that were on the phone, but are no longer accessible because they don't have the access code to mm -hmm. the phone. Um, all these, all these things, they really build up as anger and confusion, um, and really can, um, you know, I think can sort of, um, I, I don't know if they can get in the way of what is a more pure grief, a, a, a you know, a saddened grief, because now I've got to figure out, you know, where all this paperwork is. I've got to figure out, you know, I've got to go through probate, um, all that sort of stuff. So, right. yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. I think, you know, I think about the anger that I felt when my brother died was more in a pure grief, you know, model, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that was, that, that wasn't, that wasn't because he left me with a bunch of paperwork undone. It was just because he left me because right. um, he died. And then, and then I think about what some of these folks are going through who have lost a partner who, you know, uh, and, and, and lose a fair amount of um, uh, time and stability because mm -hmm. of what they're having to recreate right. or um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about how to make holidays easier. And when I say holidays, of course, I mean the standard Easter, Christmas, um, uh, Hanukkah, um, you know, Kwanzaa, all of those type of holidays where families often get together, but also the holidays that have to do with personal things like your anniversary or their birthday or just uh, an event uh, anniversary. So not necessarily a day, but um, like an event you always go, yeah. went to. Um, so things that remind you of that person and of course the fact that they're no longer here. So um, the first one that you, you marked upon in your book was be gentle. And I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about be gentle with who and what. Right. So um, I think you're absolutely right to bring up the holidays. Those are the obvious ones. Um, and then there's a lot of other days that may not be so obvious to the rest of the world. Um, I just on Friday had the seventh anniversary of my late husband's death. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so the be gentle um is be gentle with yourself and be gentle, of course, with anyone else who might be suffering the loss and, and, the, and, and the day having the day as a, what I call, these are what I call the major days, right? Um, I, I, uh, in November, I created a free download, um, that's on my website on the resources page called a griever's guide to the major days. Mm. Um, and even before we get to be gentle, I'd like to just back up a little bit and, and remind folks that there are only two rules when it comes to the major days. And those two rules, these are the only rules there are, and those rules are that you don't do harm to yourself and you don't do harm to others. Everything else is okay. Right? You want to be gentle with yourself? I recommend it. But if you don't want to be gentle with yourself and others, you don't have to be. Right? right. The only rules are you don't harm yourself, you don't harm others. Um, so so that's the that's the first and, and second and in the in the, the only two absolutes. Um, but yes, being gentle with yourself, I think, is so important. 
Um, uh, I, I like to treat myself to something. So as I'm approaching a major day, whether, whether it's Christmas or whatever, um, to sort of plot out some self treats, um, eat, you know, go to the, go to the bakery or the shop and get something that I normally don't eat because it's too indulgent and sort of save that for the day. Um, uh, I like to do that sometimes. Um, I like to, if I, if I've gotten, um, if I've, there's a, um, maybe a new type of art supply that I, that I've been intrigued, um, at the idea of experimenting with, then sometimes I treat myself to that and save it for that major day. And, um, you know, play around with it on that day, especially if it's a holiday where everybody else is going to be, you know, out and about and seeing their families and I'm, and I'm going to be alone. I like to treat myself in that way. Um, on Friday, I, um, I knew I wanted, I was in Chicago, which is where I used to live. And I have several close friends there and we had to be there on business anyway. So I scheduled um, to take a few friends to dinner on Friday night. Um, and I told them all that Bob, Bob would be paying for dinner, which was true in a way. Um, and that we would go and, and have a nice dinner. And, oh, it was so lovely. It was absolutely lovely. Now I can tell you, Bernadine, there were many years where I would never have been able to do something like that. I would, you know, I just, I would be lucky to get through the day and the evening by myself. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. Right. Um, I just happened to, you know, I happen to feel it. And these were people that I knew, you know, love me unconditionally. And I also knew, and this is another thing I recommend in that download is those plans were cancelable, right? Mm -hmm. that, I, that you don't, you, it's okay to make plans with other people, but don't make plans that you really can't bail on at the last minute. If you're just, if I had not been up to that on Friday night, all four of those people would have totally understood right. and you would have canceled the plans and it would have been absolutely fine. Right. So um, cancelable plans is another thing. Don't commit to going to a sit down dinner for eight on Christmas mm -hmm. Eve, right? That's four courses where, you know, the host, a hostess has put a lot of effort into it. And that if you get there and realize you can't do it or realize as you're getting ready, you're just not up to it, right? That's going to be a huge hole um, in that dinner party. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't make those kinds of plans, but right. you know, an open house that you can come and go and be unnoticed. And if you, because the other thing that happens is that you, you say, yeah, yeah, I can totally do this. <laughs> right. And then you get there and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Right. <laughs> and or, or I'm going to start crying. And, it, it, you know, I had, I, I, I did make the mistake one year, a couple of years after Bob died of making, of committing to an invitation um, at Christmas uh, that was a very small group. And I got there and thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this. And I had to, you know, I had no choice. Mm. Um, sometimes we, we learn these things the hard mm -hmm, way. Of course. Um, so anyway, yes, uh, those, um, those are all good ideas. So the second one in there is to know that other people um, may not understand what grief is or, right. or what you're going through. Um, so how do you suggest people deal with that? Oh, you know, it's, uh, how do I suggest they deal with that? So um, I don't entirely think it's the griever's responsibility, right? To, <laughs> To try to explain that I think it's the grievers place at that point to sort of protect themselves from exactly. someone they suspect doesn't yes. doesn't understand um so yeah to, to like I said um I would never have made those plans for Friday night with someone with people I didn't know for sure understood grief and understood that if I had to cancel or change them it was going to, you know, they would be okay with that. Right. Um, I would never, I would, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't, if I suspect someone truly doesn't understand, um, then I, I just protect myself from them. That happened. Um, also this was, um, after Bob died and, um, 
a friend, I'm using that, an acquaintance, invited me to um, her son's wedding. And uh, I said I would go and I went. And it was very hard. Weddings, I think weddings are excruciating during an acute grief um, period or day or phase. And um, I went and I did okay. I got through the ceremony. I sat down, I ate the dinner. And then I noticed another woman um, who I know who was at my table, um, you know, made her apologies and had to leave. And so I thought, oh, great. Someone's already left. I, I won't be the first. And I took that as a sign that I could leave. And this person got, you know, not that day, but let me know how disappointed she was that I had done that. She she clearly had no idea how hard um, it was for me to even get there. And so, you know, I, I really sort of kept my distance. I'm, you know, I'm not ugly to her, but I'm I'm not also counting on her to be a be a close friend and, you know, mm. And even be an understanding acquaintance, quite frankly. Right. So she's not one of your number three items, which is a red phone friend. <laughs> right. No, she's not no. a red phone friend. Okay. Yes, I do recommend for for grievers, for anybody in a tough, for caregivers, anyone in a really tough, tough, tough emotional situation to identify their red phone friends. And these are friends, right, that you could call when you are going nuclear with your grief. Um, and that you could call them any time of the day or night and they, and they would answer and they, and they will understand and they will not, you know, judge you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yes. And in, in my case, um, I have a few red phone friends. Um, I, I actually benefit more from knowing I have them than I've actually ever needed to call them, you know? Um, uh, I mean, I, I have needed to call them, but as far as like middle of the night kind of stuff, um, it really helps me to know who they are. Um, and I, I often let them know you're a red phone friend and I hope you'll consider me a red phone friend, you know, when I'm feeling better, um, or anytime, uh, cause I am capable of being a red phone friend, even when I'm grieving. Um, but, uh, yes, a red, I think a, a, a couple, two, three, four red phone friends are, um, are really essential when you're going through grief. And number four is anticipatory grief. And, uh, you talk about it as it being far worse. The anticipation of that bad day is far worse sometimes than the day itself. So we talked a little bit about that, but I was wondering if there's anything more you wanted to say. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I can tell you, I've been grieving, you know, my, my brother died 40 years ago. So I have been going through these major days, several a year for 40 years now. And inevitably, um, the anticipation, the days leading up to it in the, in, in the case of last year, it was basically, it was the entire year because it was going to be 40 years since my brother died and 20 years since my mother died. And, and, um, so in 20, 20 in sorry in 2022 um i had a whole lot of time to think about what is next year going to be like because i'm going to hit all these major um major days really big major days and so yes the and then i i did a fun thing and kind of looked back at my year through my photos um at the end of 2023 and was absolutely stunned at what an incredibly good year it was um, you know, contrary to what my anticipation had been that, oh, it was going to be miserable because I was going to have all these major time right. markers. Um, so yeah, I, and, and that's one of the reasons I like to, as you were saying that we talked about, you know, I like to like go buy myself a treat and, you know, do some preparation for the day, um, plan some stuff because, you know, as you, as you may recall from like planning a a fun vacation or a party, sometimes the anticipation of those fun things, right? Those, those are, uh, yeah, offset fun. we just need to take a little break, Jennifer, but folks will be right back. It's estimated that one in two Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. 
For many, the physical, emotional, and financial burdens are heavy. The Volunteer Cancer Driver Society ensures they never have to worry about a ride to and from treatment, offering safe, reliable, and free transportation for all patients. Now they're expanding their service across the mainland, and they need more volunteer drivers to join their fleet. If you have a vehicle, a valid driver's license with at least five years of experience, and a passion for helping those in need, the Volunteer Cancer Driver Society would love to have you. Visit volunteercancerdrivers.ca to learn more. Sometimes it seems we're all running around in our own directions. Sometimes it seems we've forgotten which way to turn. Sometimes it seems all we see is the light of our own reflection, caught in the flame of the bridges we have burned. to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm sitting down virtually talking with Jennifer O'Brien, who is the author of The Hospice Doctor's Widow, and we're talking about grief, the kind of grief that we can end up being faced with throughout the year as holidays and anniversaries come up upon us. So um, one of the things we talked about um, in the last segment was making plans that you can cancel. Um, And that's number five on your list. So I'm going to go past that to number six, which is beware of social media. 
Um, and of course, we all know how Facebook can hand us an anniversary that uh, we weren't expecting. Um, so I'm, uh, what else have you found that happens around social media? Well, I found that sometimes I get on social media and it makes me feel really connected. And other times I can get on social media and it makes me feel like everybody else is doing fun things with their family and um, I'm not, and I'm, I'm left out and feel a little um, embittered or um, envious. Um, so, so social media is a real roulette game, if you ask me. And so I, I generally tell people to sort of beware, beware that it can go either way. Mm -hmm. So number seven and number eight, um, one, seven is preparing for the day, which you talked about a little bit. But you also talk about making a schedule and a list for the day. Um, so what does that kind of look like? What would you do to prepare for a day? Right. Well, so the day, the major holiday or the death anniversary, those days are 24 hours, just like every other day. So I try to just get myself through the 24 hours. So if I, if I, if I sleep until 6 a.m., boom, I'm already through six hours of those 24, right? Mm -hmm. And if I, if I bought myself, bought myself a little treat and I decide I'm going to eat that right at 10, 10 a.m., then there I am at 10 a.m. and 10 hours are behind me, right? So, so I really, I really try to do that. I try to look at it as the 24 hours that it is. It does not go on forever. It is not larger or longer than any other day and get through it that way, kind of plot out my plans. I'm going to do this. I'm going to watch this movie at 8 p.m. because I love that movie and it always makes me feel good, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I, I take it down to the to the hours of the day. Um, do you um, may when you're when you're looking at that day, do you include activities to honor the person or the thing that you've lost? Um, what does that look like? I know people do that on awful times. Absolutely. Um, sometimes I, um, get, uh, a favorite food of, of theirs, you know, of mm. Bob's or of David's or whatever. Sometimes I, there, Bob has an essay that there's an essay that meant a lot to Bob that he used, he and I used to take a look at once in a while. So sometimes on a special day that belongs to him, I will read read that. And, um, absolutely. I, I, I strongly recommend incorporating those special members, memories and items if that works for you. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. Yeah. I'm really getting a sense that what you're talking about is to honor yourself and honor what you need and not put a judgment on that to just allow yourself to have what you need on those days. Absolutely. Uh, number nine is, um, how did you put it here? I'm looking at your book. Um, number nine is no shooting. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's the download, actually. Yes, the no shooting. So, mm. so shooting, um, yes. So uh, the word should um, is really a word of um, sort of safety and security, right? I should mm. wear my seatbelt when I'm in the car. I should pay my bills on time. That's where should belongs with those types of things. Um, should does not belong um, in an open heart with a grieving person or with yourself when you're going through something tough, right? Mm. There are enough shoulds in the world. They don't belong with grief. So, and I, I usually make a little play on words about, you know, that it's bullshit. Mm. <laughs> um, Good word to shoot on yourself, kind of those, those kinds of things. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. No shooting on yourself um, when it comes to major days or when it comes to grieving um, those that, that word is for um, not, not for the major grieving days. That's those that's for safety, security, financial responsibility. Those right. that's what it is for. Right. And number 10 in your booklet is congratulate yourself on getting through it. Yeah, absolutely. What is that? You know, like? 
Oh, to me, it's just, it's usually just uh, if I, you know, if I happen to be awake at midnight, which is pretty rare for me, um, you know, to be able to say I, I did it, I, um, like another, another one down, you know, um, uh, yeah, and it, and just let myself enjoy that and, and congratulate myself on getting through it, because getting mm -hmm. through it is really hard, whether it should be or not, it is, and so I just, I deserve congratulations when I did something really hard like that. So if you're somebody who processes or works through or deals with things by not thinking about it and not planning it and not talking to anybody, those things are still okay, right? Those things are still a part oh, of the no shooting. It, you are allowed to to process and and be in that day however works best for you is kind of what I'm getting from what you're saying. 100%. Um, in fact, you know, when I think back to the early days after my brother David died, um, I was very much that person. I, I, my mother wanted to, you know, go out on his birthday and do something fun. And I did not, I wanted to be alone and I wanted to just, I wanted the day to go by and just, you know, make it through. Um, and both of those reactions are absolutely perfectly normal. And, um, and I certainly did a lot less back then. Um, and then even, you know, for the first year or so after Bob died, I probably was less inclined to, you know, I never would have, I never would have taken out four friends to dinner on the first anniversary of Bob's death, right? That I just wouldn't have. Um, so sometimes it takes some time. Um, and sometimes it's just your style, right? There's a, that, that it's more important to just push through the day and get through it and be alone because that's where you feel comfortable. Absolutely. Like I said, only two rules. There's only two rules and everything else is perfectly normal. I agree. Um, so tell me about where folks can find your book. Oh, you can find my book um, on um, Amazon Canada. Um, it is available there. I think anything else from the States would be the, the shipping is just horrendous. So I'm not sure it would be, you know, wise to buy it directly from the publisher. I would just go to Amazon um, Canada, the free download that you've, that we've mostly been talking about in this um, conversation is uh, hospicedoctorswidow.com and go to the resources page. I've got a number of resources there. Um, mm -hmm. but this one is called a griever's guide to the major days. And it, 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 it was very popular during the holidays, but I just looked at the numbers and noticed quite a few have been downloaded even since Christmas. So right. it, it really is an all year round yes. <laughs> kind of a guide. It is an all year round thing. You, the other books you have there are art journaling props because of course you are an, uh, an artist and uh, did produce an art journal. You tend to care, give yourself care tips mm -hmm. um, at peace toolkit. What is that? Well, that is that my late husband, who, like I said, was a palliative care physician and hospice physician, that he would use the term precious time when he would share with a family that the patient was actually nearing death. And he would mm. say, you're into precious time. And precious time is when you say what you need to say and you don't say what you will later regret. And, it, right. and it's in my book and it is the term has become in some ways larger than the book itself. And a lot of healthcare professionals are finding that a very useful term to convey to families, you know, that they don't, that they don't, this isn't going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. um, and that they will, you know, the person will die. And, and if they don't say what they need to say or not say what they really shouldn't, you know, don't need to say, they don't say their I love yous and their thank yous and their goodbyes that they may feel regret afterward. Um, and yet saying your person is dying is really harsh. Mm -hmm. So this term you're into precious time, which my husband coined has really become useful. So that 
that is you're welcome anyone is welcome to download it but it was designed for healthcare professionals right. to help them communicate to families that death is nearing so that's uh hospice doctors widows is the name of your book it's called a journal it's uh done with uh, art collage and they can get that from amazon and your website is hospice doctors widow that's uh doctors is spelled drs widow all one word dot com thank you jennifer for coming and chatting with me about this it's an important topic and i hope that uh that people will be able to um help them help themselves get through the day so thank you my pleasure and we'll be right back folks and I wanna wait and I wanna find like everybody else. This year, Co-op Radio turns 40. This is one of our stories. And somebody said, said, oh, I was reading in the paper, there's a station starting up where anybody can go on. And I said, so so where is it? And they said, well, it's called Co-op Radio, and it's right down in Kitchen Park. Anyway, the next day, I went down. The building was completely empty. There was one guy sitting at a desk reading a pocketbook. And he said, can I help you? So I said, well, I... I heard that uh, uh, I heard that anybody can get on the radio, and he goes, well, "Not anybody." He says, "What did you want to do?" I said, "I wanted to do a rock history program." He says, "What about music?" And I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "Well, we're not interested in ego tripping disc jockeys down here." So I said, "Well, that isn't what I want to do." Anyway, I kept uh, hanging around, and there was jobs to do. Think, you know, shelves to be built, and they said, Oh, I'll come back tomorrow with a hammer and a saw. You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox. And that's our show. My thanks to Jennifer O'Brien, the hospice doctor's widow, for sharing her coping strategies during the holidays while dealing with grief. Our music today was by David Laurent, Edith Wallace, and Sherry Alwick. And to you, our guests, thank you for joining us. Stay safe out there. You've just listened to Rethreading Madness, where we dare to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program, or want to share your story, or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. This is Bernadine Fox. We'll be back next week. Until then. Say to be nice.